Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We're so happy that you could make it with us, and we really appreciate you being here today. Um, today is a webinar series that we're doing that's getting into uh, the educational uh, of the future. We're going to try to design an education system of the future. So we're looking at various stakeholders who are going to talk about their perspective roles and how that uh, works uh, with, uh, with designing the future. And one of the things we're going to try to do, just to tell you a little bit about us, we are, we are the organization that's sponsoring is the Social Innovators for Americans Association. We're primarily a nonprofit 501c3. We go out and we provide social and humanitarian research to communities for free. Um, that includes everything from applied research to uh, innovation management to change management uh, to help them uh, come up with better ideas to solve the problem so they're not continuously dealing with those recurring issues and we get to the root cause of the problem. And that's kind of what we do. We offer that service um, to all of our communities and all of our nonprofits that work with us. So today I'm very happy to have uh, the guests that I have. I'm really excited for them. and I'm really excited for my audiences that's dialing in. One thing I want you guys to know that this is a very participatory kind of uh, 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 presentation. So I'm really looking for everybody online to come on and put information in the chat. The only thing that we ask is that you do not spam the chat. So do not put a lot of stuff about your contact information and things of that nature. But what we are looking for is anything that sparks your thoughts or memories or interests, puts your comments, your views, your opinions. We want all that information captured in the chat because that's gonna help us um, collect the information that we're gonna use to start looking at some of the issues and looking at some of the great ideas as well. So we're gonna do that. So without further ado, let me begin to uh, introduce my, my guest. So first of all, I have uh, Dr. Trina uh, Coleman, Trina L. Coleman. Trina is a PhD in theoretical nuclear physics. She's worked as, as a CIO with many HBCUs, I'm sorry. Um, and she's also the CEO and founder of Coleman Comprehensive Solutions uh, Corporation. We also have with us uh, Mr. Brian Setzer. Uh, he is a CEO of Setzer Group. Uh, that takes, they take that diverse and inclusion approach to address most complex education and business challenges that we will face. And he can tell you more about that when he, uh, when he speaks. And we also are happy to have Mr. Rod Smith, who is the CTO for uh, Clayton County Public Schools in Georgia. It's the fifth largest school district in Georgia. It covers 143 square miles, 67 learning campuses, and 55,000 students. So we are really, really happy to have our, our guests with us today. Our approach today is going to be more of a scenario-based approach. So I'm going to give a scenario to our speakers, and then they're going to address those uh, scenarios um, from, their, from their unique perspective and their unique uh, background. So our first scenario um, has to do with uh, the COVID environment. So what is a day in the life of you in these particular roles? So, uh, it, and Mr. Mr. Smith, so in February 2020, your county and school district decides that students are going to do remote learning uh, in this COVID pandemic. The question is, you have a you have a you have one principal, Miss 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 Principal Jones, who's in your school district, and she complains that 30% of the students in your in her school do not have access to the internet and cannot get online. Um, in this particular case, what do you tell? Uh, Principal Jones, and how is how how can you as a CTO help her and her school and her students? <clears throat> well, thank you, um, Dr. Coleman, for even inviting me to participate in a panel. And that's a great question, but it's a very real question in the K-12 environment. Um, what I would share with you relative to our school district, we had that very scenario, but I will tell you that the 30% for, for Principal Jones was a lot higher. We do have a Principal Jones. So that percentage was more like 70% of our students in a particular school didn't have reliable internet access. <clears throat> so one of the things that we had to do right, right away in terms of trying to uh, assist Principal Jones and, and that 70% in your, in your challenge, the 30% is to figure out what could we do to provide those students reliable internet access. That's a problem nationally, right? Clayton County wasn't the only school district who, and, and not just in urban school districts, but even in rural school districts, that challenge is there. What we were fortunate enough to do is to reach out to some of our partners. Uh, we have a foundation here in the district and, and, and we scrambled right away to try to provide 
um, that to fill that 30% gap. And the real gap for schools in urban districts is really about 20 to 25% without reliable internet access. So we were able to do that through some partnerships with um, T-Mobile um, through our grant and through, uh, I want to say the 100 black men of Atlanta also helped. We purchased some, some uh, hotspots and then we distributed those hotspots to the families that were most in need. And we did that by sharing that information with our community via our superintendent. So it, it, it's a real issue and, and, we and we tackled that challenge by putting the word out that we needed assistance from our partners. Very good. So Mr. Uh, Setzer, so Mr. Smith has had this problem. He's come up with some ideas, but he wants to bounce some ideas off of a consultant. So he goes to his Rolodex and he calls you, Mr. Brian. And how can you help him? What would you tell him? What, would you, what can your company do to help him and how can they help him uh, in this particular situation? Dr. J, I echo uh, Rod's comments. Thanks for inviting us tonight and giving us a chance to share and learn with everybody. And it's a good place to start in terms of just listening, right? So uh, Superintendent Smith has a unique context. Uh, you know, any consultant who comes in and doesn't listen uh, is making a misstep. In other words, the community matters. Uh, all things are local. The context that people work in, the communities that they serve. Uh, I think that um, one of the best things that can be done on the front end is to really understand what's happening, who's at the table, who's missing, who should be involved. And so as we begin to get a picture of what the district looks like, what its cares are, what its interests are, then we start to have an approach where we can start to think about what we see out there in benchmarks. So for instance, something I've seen in New York City is not going to be applicable to a certain rural geography or something that I might see overseas might not work in the context of, you know, urban Charlotte. So the point is what you try to do is you try to look at things that have proved to be useful or valuable and you wanna put those things together in the context that Superintendent Smith is working in. So what I call that is a, a kit of parts, right? So, you know, if I see something that works great in Texas to promote rural broadband access, it's not a magic solution that it may also work outside of Atlanta. However, if we start to look at those kit of parts, we can assemble something new and unique in the context of Superintendent Superintendent Smith. So it's a two-part answer for me. We do a lot of listening and learning from what the unique context is. And then we kind of peek across the hedges, not only in the United States, but around the world and say, what solution could we apply? And the last thing I would say in concluding my remarks is, you know, lots of people have been trying things throughout the last 30 years that have been evidence-based and we still don't use them. We still don't even know about them. And then some people are trying new and different things, but here's the message, new, different, old, that's not necessarily better, better is better. So I would advise Superintendent Smith and his unique context and from the influences we have. Very good, very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. TLC Coleman. <laughs> so my question to you is, in this same school district, there is a small HBCU. Uh, let's go with uh, Morris Brown, okay? Um, they just, uh, just, just, just got their accreditation and the counselor at Principal Jones School calls the, uh, the CIO there and said, hey, 60% of my, my students, my graduating seniors, I mean, 20% of my graduating seniors are gonna be going to your school, um, but they can't do remote. We don't, have the, we don't have the capacity to do that. A lot of these students can't, get online to do the remote, but they're going to be, they've accepted and they're going to be going to your school. Um, so the CIO, um, Dr. Uh, Kevin James gets on the phone and they say, Dr. Dr. Colbert, how can you help us? What can you help us do in this particular situation with the, uh, the new students that are coming into the school? Wow. Well, thank you for having me. And you know, higher ed is my wheelhouse. <laughs> so um, it's a combination of things. Uh, 
first of all, first and foremost, our HBCUs are very, very important, but they also have challenges. Morris Brown is one of the unique special challenges. Um, IT assessments, I cannot stress enough, are very critical to understanding what the uh, infrastructure is of all of our campuses. Uh, those students that are wanting to go and attend Morris Brown, take classes at Morris Brown, but don't have the infrastructure at home, nor does Morris Brown have adequate infrastructure, I'd say that um, my starting point would be to see what the baseline is at Morris Brown and um, bring the students to that level as far as what the instructional capabilities are, uh, what they can do on their phones, for example, everybody's phone has a level of connectivity. Um, I think also that Morris Brown can, can, can hit up some corporations and have that also be part of the challenge because right now in this pandemic era, uh, our HBCUs are getting a lot of support from uh, foundations in corporate America because we are that important. So I would say to uh, Dr. James, look, Dr. James, um, I'll be down there in a couple weeks and I can walk you through this issue and also the academic side. So, so my wheelhouse is the technology as well as the academic side. So uh, my experience as a former assistant provost, also a former executive director for enterprise systems and all of those skills will come into play at the same time for a successful academic year for Morris Brown. Okay, thank you. So let me go back to you, Mr. Uh, Smith. So. Uh, Dr. Trina was Dr. Trina Coleman was basically saying, "Hey, um, the school has its own problems. Is there anything you can do with uh, the students that are graduating to help um, those students connect to the university? Is that part of the uh, remit of the public school system, or is that totally outside of the, the, the uh, bounds of what the public school system can do for kids going to private and public colleges?" Well, <clears throat> so that's a great question. Um, let me say, part of the gap between K-12 and higher ed is what you just described, right? I think there should be a closer alignment between the K-12 environment and the higher ed environment. We collect a lot of data on those students from the time they get in kindergarten all the way until they graduate. <clears throat> the higher ed side can use that data, but back to your question, I think, the, I think the main thing that we do now and what this pandemic has done is it really shines a spotlight on some of what those inequities are. And I'll give you a good example. We have 54,000 students in Clayton County. You've already alluded to the fact that about 30% of our students didn't have reliable in internet access. Well, on top of that, we had probably 75 to 80% of our students who didn't have a laptop uh, or a Chromebook. <clears throat> then when you have one Chromebook, when you're, in all in a, when you're in all virtual, you have one Chromebook, but a parent may have four kids at home. So, I mean, all of these equities start to be exposed. We had to address that. And one of the things we were able to do is, and we got ahead of the pandemic rush for purchasing Chromebooks, and we were able to get close to 40,000 Chromebooks for our students. We repurposed some of the other devices that we had so that we could outfit the K through two. The main thing that leads to your question is one of the things that was exposed is that connection between higher ed and K-12. L, so we didn't have an enterprise LMS. There are kids right now that are going to start college in the fall. And if they are in a district without an LMS, I can tell you we're doing them a disservice because at higher ed, the LMS is one of the most important platforms that we have now. And I, and I know Dr. Coleman, uh, Dr. Trina Coleman could speak to that. That's something that, that brings some value to them making that transition from K-12 to higher ed, having that exposure to an LMS, um, having this situation now is forcing them to do remote learning, turning in assignments electronically, having office hours, having office hours with their professors um, through things like Zoom and Google Meet. This is gonna help um, and, and the from a technical standpoint. Now, 
I will say this, and I'll never uh, not say this when I'm on one of these panels or presentation, none of that technology is ever going to take the place of a quality instructor, right? Yeah. So we always have to make sure that we keep quality instruction at the forefront. But that's one of those things that I think can help close that gap between higher ed and, and K-12. And that, that leads us to, to our next uh, scenario. So thank may you. May I jump much. in quickly, please? You sure may, ma'am. All right. Uh, just to, to comment on... Um, uh, the previous comments, uh, yes, the LMS is uh, essential and LMS, for those of you who don't know, stands for the learning management system. The learning management system will make things very much more efficient. So going to, uh, coming from a, a school system that does not have one means uh, manual grades, <laughs> manual calculations, manual everything. Manual and just transferring of data, analyzing of data is nearly impossible. So that is also going to contribute to the gap as far as uh, assessing your students accurately and being able to make the best uh, decisions or help them to guide them into the right direction. I am done. Cool, thank you. <laughs> for now. So, so let's go into the next scenario. So for everybody online now uh, who, who, who didn't hear at the beginning, we really, really want to hear your input. So we're asking you to go into the chat. If you're on YouTube, go into the chat. Um, YouTube should be up. I saw that somebody commented that it wasn't up. It should be up now. Please go to the YouTube site and uh, you can do it there. But also here in Zoom, uh, please add your comments. We really, really want to help uh, hear from you. Um, that's what makes this public forum uh, valuable to us. It's also share information with you, but also get your inputs. You've experienced these things. You have some ideas, you have some experiences with them as well. So let me go to the next uh, scenario here. So this is what I call the big challenge scenario. So we wanna go to the big challenge scenario. So uh, so Dr. Coleman, uh, the CIO from uh, Mo Brown calls you again and uh, Dr. Kevin James calls you again and he decides uh, that he wants to prepare his students for the fourth industrial, revolu rev fourth industrial, uh, industrial uh, revolution. Um, and you know what that is, but you want to make sure he knows what it is. So you ask him, well, exactly what is that, uh, Dr. James? And he said, well, you know, where all of the uh, technologies are all coming together, where the biotechnology, digital technology, and physical, tech, physical sciences are all coming together to create an entirely new industry, unlike what we've seen before. And he asks you, okay. You say, okay, that's great. That's great. He says, but I want to make sure that our school is able to compete. I want to be able to close the global gap uh, between my students and the international students and their ability to use technologies. So Dr. Coleman, here's what we want you to do. Help us understand what are some of the things that we can do? What are some of the technologies? What are some of the technologies in the lab? What are some of the IT infrastructure do we need to put in place so that our students can be competitive for this new world? Is there anything you can do to help it? I can. Now, whether he will take my advice or not is the other thing. <laughs> and that that's part of the challenge. And I am being very blunt and honest with um, dealing with administration in general, be it K-12 or higher ed. Uh, li listen to the people that you ask advice of. <laughs> so the first thing is to say, well, what what are your goals? What What is the plan for... Morris Brown, do you want to have a cybersecurity program? Do you want to have an art, uh, AI, VR, all of that? That goes back to my original, original comment about your IT assessment. Do you have the capabilities to support those types of endeavors? Do you have the bandwidth? Do you have the, the support staff to make sure your network is up and running? Um, do you have... Uh, proper space to do those types of activities. And um, so looking at your, your IT, your data closets, um, then once you get all of that stuff taken care of, which is gonna take you a couple years, parallel to that, making sure you have those programs in place or you're putting those programs in place along with recruitment. You don't wanna have a program if you don't have students in it. <laughs> so saying I want one of these and not, you know, making sure that someone is going to use it when you have it uh, in place is another thing that you need to be cognizant of. 
So like I said, higher ed is my wheelhouse. I've seen one of everything. I've done almost one of everything. So <laughs> those are the things that are relevant and important when we start talking about ed tech. Ed tech is a sexy topic to discuss, but when it comes time to implementing or even understanding, a lot of people don't even understand the technological side of education to a point where they can weigh in on those types of decisions, which is why you need to trust the experts that you bring on board in order to make those decisions. So from what, from if I could summarize what I think I heard is, is that one, you have to listen to the, the experts that, that you have. And two, you have to assess what it is you want to accomplish. What are your objectives? Is it to be the best in cyber? Is it to be the best in artificial intelligence? Is it to be the best in visual, I mean, our virtual realization, I mean, virtual reality? Uh, what are the things that your students want to be best at? Where is this fourth industrial in, uh, industri fourth industrial revolution going? I mean, where do your students want to be at? And that will then lead you to be able to figure out what technologies they need. That is okay. exactly right. And Thank also you. stick stick with what you're going to go with. Don't try to do everything at the same time. <laughs> Pick okay. one, do that one. Then if there's interest in the next one, go move forward from there. So uh, Mr. Smith, so in the same scenario, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. James uh, calls your superintendent and you're on the phone, you're on the teleconference with him. And he lets you know that, hey, we need good students coming out of your public school systems. Um, and so the US News report says that Georgia is number 30 out of 50 states in public education. Um, you're also, as, and, and also in the United States, we are 26th in the world for public education behind China, Canada, Japan, and Korea, and many, many more. Um, so he asked you, uh, hey, can you guys sit down and come up with a 10-year plan, a 10-year strategy that's going to lay out what the technology roadmap should be for your school so that you can feed into our program with the right types of students? Um, Mr. Smith, what are the types of things that you guys would have a discussion about in your school to, type of, to feed into a program like that? So Dr. Coleman, I can tell you, you asked some really long questions. So I'm having to calculate the question in my head and collect a lot of information. So I'll try to answer that. So if I leave anything out, feel free to, to chime back in and say you missed a point. <clears throat> but that's a real scenario again. So we are 30th in, 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 in the country. Um, I think I would start with um, tr trying to do let me back up for a second. For too long, we've been trying to design education the way that we think it should be, right? Without bringing those stakeholders to the table to help us make some real decisions. So the very first thing I would do is say, in this 10-year roadmap, we're gonna identify all the stakeholders, parents, teachers, and students, community members, business members. We have Delta right here in our backyard. Why aren't they at the table? Because they offer um, um, uh, airline, not airline mechanics, but um, aviation yeah. mechanics, right? Mm -hmm. And so why don't we have aviation mechanic programs in our school for school for students to leave K-12, uh, leave high school and go to a two-year college? So I would sit down with all those stakeholders and we would start that 10-year strategy with designing instead of designing for, but designing with, right? Mm -hmm. You and I have had conversations in the past about how most people like to design without the end user in mind. Well, I would have those end users at the table. Then I would figure out how do we, you know, how do we identify what a student's interest is at a very early age so that we can start putting that student on that path, right? So that by the time they get to high school, they already have uh, somewhat of an indoctrination, indoctrination, if you will, about the path that they want to go in, right? So we do that at the high school level. Um, students go to career paths, right? But we mm -hmm. should be starting the career paths somewhere down at the elementary level. They may not know exactly what they want to do at that point, but we have those opportunities for them. So, so the main thing that I would do to start that 10-year strategy plan would, be, would really be to bring all the stakeholders to the table so that we can design for success as opposed to designing for what we've seen for the past, I don't know, 200 years or so. Well, that's, that's a good perspective. So as a CTO, your job is not just to buy technologies and stick them in there. It's really to understand the situation and put the right technologies in there. 
So let me let me ask uh, 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 Mr. Setzer. He's going to close out this this round. Um, since you've been on this panel, you now know Dr. Coleman. You now know Mr. Smith, and they both called you and, did, and wanted your opinion. How would you approach this uh, technology uh, closing this technology gap from a K through twelve perspective as well as from a higher ed perspective? So you know. First of all, with Trina's comments around being data informed, I think that assessment, diagnostics, looking at all the available data is important. And then it's time to be data wise, where you look at that information and ask yourself what's missing and what gaps need to be solved for. I think with um, Rod, we're talking about uh, steps that allow you to design with, which I'm also a proponent of in terms of, you know, liberatory design. We do a lot with diversity, equity, and inclusion where we don't copy models that are just based on strategic planning or, you know, strategic uh, platforms. We also look at adding those two key pieces of liberatory design, and they are notice and reflect. So before you can empathize with anybody, you've got to notice who the talent is, who the stakeholders are, and what are their interests over 10 years, five years, three years, and yearly. Now, I want to, I want to slightly build on a couple of points in terms of bringing groups together like K-12, higher ed, and workforce. Chris Deedy writes about the 60-year curriculum We've heard people talk about cradle to grave learning, womb to tomb learning, where we are all going to be from sounds and exposure in prenatal learning all the way to society contributing with health advances well into our 80s and 90s. So how do you serve a system or a community that right now is fractured, partisan, uh, looking at this country in ways where we're not doing enough what David Brooks calls weaving and getting people together of different perspectives and opinions and positions and saying, what are some commonalities we all share? So if you're going to design for an ecosystem, whether it's in a, a high urban metro area or a rural area, and you want to bring K-12, community college, higher ed and workforce together, the first thing you need to do is as old as Stephen Covey's teachings, begin with the end in mind. What would greatness look like? What would a different view of humanity look like? And once you paint that picture, you can start to backwards design who needs to be at the table to inform this. Are we as white men ceding our privilege and power to be inclusive of more dynamic voices and perspectives to design for communities that have been underserved, communities that have been uh, served in ways that were based on a premise that was faulty at best. So part of bringing all of these elements together is having a diverse, equitable, inclusive guiding coalition to start aiming towards that 10 year mark and then backwards design on what matters most every 90 days, every year, every three-year horizon. Because true innovation is really about iteration and using innovation as a verb, Dr. J. I know you've taught me this, where it's, it's not a noun. It's about looking at your data, making adjustments, and people informing that. So I look at it as those key stakeholders need to be involved, but you also need to notice who's involved and then reflect on their contributions throughout the process. That's awesome. That's awesome. Exactly. So it's really interesting to hear you. We're going to take one question uh, before before we go. But it's really interesting to hear all three of you guys talk. Um, you all have very strong technologies background, but you didn't go into all of the nitty gritties of the technologies. Each and every one of you really talked about that the technology is part of a society. It all works together. It all has to be woven together, and all of the stakeholders have to be have to play into that game. The technology is just an enabler. It doesn't define, it doesn't shape, it doesn't change. It just makes things happen for people. And I think that's a very interesting perspective. So I'm gonna uh, go over to, uh, to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Watson and see if there are any questions that you want to address. 
Well, good evening, uh, Dr. Coleman. Uh, we have a host of questions <laughs> in the Q&A, and I have informed uh, those that are listening um, privately that we will try to answer as many questions as possible or as time will allow. So I would say one of the first questions um, that have been asked um, is how can schools tackle the shortage of ESL teachers using technology? That's very good. Um, who would like to start off? I, I, guess, I guess that I could try to answer that question because I, I guess I'm in, K, in, in the K-12 environment, but I don't pretend for anybody listening that I am a, um, a ESOL uh, expert, but I can tell you some of the things that we do in the district relative to trying to attract um, those um, teachers. Um, you know, being in a pandemic right now, every teacher that's listening will understand this, that one of the things that teachers look for in a district is uh, an environment where teachers and the administration, principals, the leadership team cares about teachers. Um, we've gotten a lot of kudos from our teachers um, because my superintendent has made the decision we will continue to be virtual and remote until, these, until our numbers go down. So we've had a lot of the surrounding counties um, to, to, go back to go back from virtual, go to face-to-face, -face, do blended. And they're doing all of these things and people are still getting sick, students are still getting sick. And we've been rock solid about our position or he has about our position for not going back. So I think the first thing for ESL teachers is, is they wanna work somewhere where they think people care about them. I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, you're not gonna take any of this stuff with you um, you need to feel safe, you need to feel protected, and you need to feel like they care about you. Um, okay. The other big thing would probably just be money. Um, okay. To try to figure out, you know, ways that we can oh. incentivize uh, teachers. Yeah, so speaking of money, um, Dr. Um, Dr. Coleman, um, first of all, answer the question, and then, because uh, we know that uh, 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 Ms. McKenzie uh, has millions of dollars that she's given to HBCU, so money should not be a problem when it comes to this problem. So, uh, Dr. Coleman, how would you handle this? Oh, I know how I would handle having money at HBCUs. <laughs> no, the, ECA, uh, the, 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 uh, the other part about the question, as far as Eng English as a second language, I have not encountered that as an issue. I am. Um, as, as you know, I also teach physics at two HBCUs right now. Um, my students are primarily African-American students, but uh, on a hypothetical, if, if that was an issue, one of the things that, that I will go back to is the LMS piece of it all. Um, there's gonna be some challenges if students' uh, first language is in English, how they interact with the uh, platforms that are in place that are digital in order to have success in the classroom. So that's something that I have not yet seen um, as far as a, a bilingual LMS system, which um, if, if uh, we're going to jot notes down, I came up with that one first. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, um, having access to resources is always a positive. Being able to bring in experts to help bridge that gap as well. There, there are so many gaps to bridge, um, but that one is an additional gap that needs bridging, especially if we are going to do recruitment and uh, have uh, students come to our HBCUs from different backgrounds and ethnicities. Yeah, so we know that that, with, that's a relevant uh -huh. question and point that needs to be looked at that I had not thought of before. Yeah, and I know that with a lot of the HBCUs, their international uh, population is increasing significantly from countries like Africa and the Middle East and things of that nature. Right. So but during the pandemic, uh, uh, it's uh, more Mr. difficult. It's, yeah. it's more difficult now to to engage because they're not on campus. They're not face-to-face. -face. So yeah. having them enrolled is one thing, but having them on campus is completely different. So Mr. Sester, how, how would you uh, deal with this? So I'm a global advisor to Aquila Institute and also Davis College. We have uh, work that we do in Rwanda. Also, they're expanding to Hong Kong. And I've been in that role, I guess, for 
the last five years in different capacities. And so I bring a lens to this, having worked with some folks in the Department of Defense around the world and Italy and Germany and Puerto Rico as well, to look at an assessment of what is needed for bilingualism to occur, right? So some of it is definitely native applications. So you do have tools and resources ranging from Duolingo to Bazoo to Linguist to Rosetta Stone to Memrise. Those technologies are there, but now we get back to some of the earlier conversations. Who can access them? How? How does that get out to equity of access? So take something like Rwanda where you don't have internet once you leave the urban area, even to a level that you have in the US around surrounding rural areas for that second and last mile. So they may be using mesh internet or, or satellite internet, a host of things just to enable the download hard copy cache of things they're trying to learn in two languages. You know, there used to be a time when uh, uh, students internationally would pay $50,000 to be trained on how to take tests to enter the US, either in higher ed or workforce or K-12. With open source technologies and ESL, that stuff has become ubiquitous and really accessible. But getting people to understand where it resides and how it lives is a different thing. The last point I would make, because I know we're on a tight time schedule, is my uh, children went to Spanish uh, preschool and then they matriculated into a Spanish and Chinese international school. So when they were going through and making those choices, some of the teachers were brought in through visiting international faculty programs. Some of the applications helped support and supplement that work. That ought to be a right and fundamental privilege of any child anywhere with as strong as technology is. So it's really about how we feel about the fact that we haven't done it. And hopefully COVID has put an accelerant on it so that regardless of your zip code, you can have access to a world-class education. And that's gonna really start with really getting serious about broadband and really getting serious about the supports around it in the various communities in the US. Thank you very much. So I want to thank you guys for taking the time to do this. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I haven't been paying too much attention to the chat, but I really hope that uh, the audience has contributed their ideas, their views, their perspectives. Um, as I said before, that really helps us uh, understand what's really going on when it comes to ed tech and the types of issues. Um, and we could not cover everything in, in a one hour session. The conversation will continue. Um, we have LinkedIn, social media, and uh, Facebook where we have websites, I mean, uh, where we have uh, pages that we'll send those out to you guys, and you will be able to share and uh, continue the conversation there as well. We'll collect all of the information that you guys have shared with us, and we'll make that available and, uh, and, and, a, and basically an online uh, whiteboard session um, that you guys will be able to review and see and copy if you want to and use at your, uh, for your own purposes. Um, as far as I guess, uh, they're also on social media. So if you have anything that you want to reach out to them, you can reach out to them on social media as well. Um, and then they will also uh, make themselves available to you. Um, I'm, I'm sure they have very busy schedules and they'll do their best um, to make themselves available to you or point you to the right direction. So again, uh, thank you everybody for, for doing this. You will get an email following up this, uh, this uh, telecon. I'm um, telling you more about where you can get some of the information, how you can stay in touch with us and, and some of the things that we're doing. So again, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and I hope everyone has a, a great evening. Um, and I was just informed that we were going to 7.30, not seven o'clock. <laughs> no one else said anything to me. <laughs> I was wondering why you were trying to get rid of me. <laughs> well, like I have like good. 24 I minutes to work. I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> So thank you. I'm sorry. So Kim, give me one more. I mean, sorry, uh, Dr. Kim, give me one more question there. Oh, absolutely. Well, we have quite a bit of questions. So um, I want to just take a few minutes to just a second to thank Babakar Nyang for that last question. And so I'll go to our next question from Dr. Tara Gleason. She's a New York-based educator, and she says she her question is. There has been a huge number of teachers who have left the profession due to these various challenges being presented by the panelists. 
What strategies should administrators take to not only lessen the achievement gap of students in regard to remote learning, but ensure teaching, teacher attrition and quality teaching does not decline? So who would like to take that question? Did I lose my other guest? Uh, I think I'm the only one left. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, teacher, uh, how do we keep the teachers from jumping ship is what I think I heard based <laughs> on, uh, I, yeah, I'm real blunt like that. <laughs> uh, good question. I mean, in the pandemic, I, I don't even know how to even approach that because I know some school districts, especially K through 12, um, they're home, then they're not at home, now they're going home, then they went back home because people were getting sick. I don't even know how I would even manage that process. I know, um, my, like I said, my, my expertise is in higher ed, but um, giving them the flexibility to choose, I think would be the, the best way to keep people on board without it being such a mandate that, that school districts say, well, we're going back in to the classroom and that's the way it's going to be as opposed to do you feel comfortable going back into the classroom or do you want to go back into the classroom? I don't know how realistic it is, but it seems like it's the most reasonable thing if you want to keep your talent pool in place. Okay. Oh, I hope I answered the question. You did. So I'm, I'm going to, so, so Dr. Trin, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the, to the last scenario anyway, and uh, okay. maybe you can address this question. So um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the future of technology and where, where the technology is going. Um, and one of the things that I'd like to um, ask you is if, if, if we had Google and Google now has this new technology, this uh, artificial intelligence platform, um, and this artificial intelligence platform, um, it has the ability to do very uh, student-centric um, uh, training and, and learning paths. So it will customize um, a particular learning path for a particular student uh, based off of their skills, their knowledge, their learning abilities, and it will plot that whole path out for them from K through high school and through college even. Um, and they've, they've, they've demonstrated this, they've done some trials with this, and they've shown that 60% improvement and standardized test scores for some of the uh, poor performing schools, uh, both colleges and high schools have been, uh, has benefited from this particular technology. Um, for your higher education clients, uh, what would you tell them about the risk and the benefits of investing in this, uh, this subscription-based technology for their distance learning programs? All right, let's start with my mic on, risks. Yes. Okay, uh, risk num number one is uh, security. As far as network, if the information is being transmitted from students location to university via the internet, then there's always that, that risk of breach of data, of breach of network. Um, also, the other thing I would say about it is that with the technology that Google uses for um, for the Alexa, for example, where its ears are always on, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's that's one of the other risks that I see with the uh, the uh, technology as far as um, the machine learning, because once once that that device or that system gets accustomed to learning your patterns, then it learns your patterns. And then it takes that information and it lays it on top of the other things that are being co collected about you in general. So not only do they have raw data, they have uh, the objective data and subjective data. So to me, those are things that should be separate. And one should just kind of not be there at all, but that's my opinion. Um, pros of it are the fact that you can have um, the customized learning environment that you described. Um, and also students tend to be more responsive when they're dealing with technology 
uh, the younger students, perhaps more so than the higher ed students. Um, higher ed students are too busy for that. <laughs> and like, and I'll give you a perfect example during the pandemic. Uh, my students work and some of them log in the class while they're working. So they're listening, but they can't necessarily participate. Some of them are waitresses. Some, some of them are drivers for Amazon or UPS and things like that. So the machine learning is a is a great technology. The 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 customized learning type of of environment, it is probably helpful for students that are not as um, intellectually savvy. I'll say. <laughs> so, um, but but for the most part, I think that it may complicate the learning process a little oh. bit because it'll incorporate that extra facet of, of I got to do this for that. And then it's going to give me some feedback on how I did it. And it may not be accurate because I was distracted. You know, it's like there are factors that cannot be factored in based okay. on the fact that this technology is looking at what it sees as opposed okay. to other things that it's not seeing. Okay. So, uh, so Mr. Smith, thank you for joining me. And I do apologize to everyone on the call. Um, about my uh, uh, premature ending of the, the meeting. I do apologize. I yeah, really thought this went. You can so tell I took, the, I took the tie off already. I was at the door <laughs> about ready to take the jacket off. So, yeah, so, no so, so we're going to go into, we're into the, the third scenario. And it's really about, uh, for example, if Google has a, a AI um, a cloud-based system, that's a subscription-based system, um, and um, everybody... Um, it basically does uh, student-centric learning, performance-based learning, um, and the AI customizes it specifically to each and every student in the program. Uh, for you, I wanna, I'm gonna ask the question a slightly different way. So for you, uh, this technology is available by subscription, um, but the big challenge that, you're, uh, that you may have in your school district is a lot of the teachers and their unions and even some of the parents may complain about robots are gonna take our jobs. How would you explain to them, one, the technology and the risk and the benefits of uh, some type of this technology? Would it be helpful to the instructors or the teachers or would it be um, bad for them? Would, would you agree that it's gonna take away their jobs? So, so I, I had an opportunity to present about two years ago in San Diego and we were talking about that very thing at a round table after I presented, right? And one of the things that I have always stood fast on, I did four years in the classroom. And let me just say this, there is nothing that's gonna ever replace a quality teacher who knows their content well, that can deliver that content. So when you start thinking about AI and what AI can do, it could supplement some of that. So you can build uh, a model that would learn uh, enough about a particular group or a student that could help facilitate some of their learning but AI can never take the place of a quality instructor who knows their content. And I'll use uh, Dr. Coleman for an example. Imagine trying to take physics from an AI model, right? I struggled with physics when I was in college. So, you know, I don't know, I don't know of a, of a model uh, or an AI model that's going to be able to bring me the nuance that I'll need from a, a live person who understands that content who can adjust on the fly, AI can only take you so far. So I don't think teachers have to uh, even be worried about that. What I think teachers need to be really focused on is in this rich technology environment that we find ourselves in at higher ed and K-12, teachers have to be willing to, to, to um, go a little bit further to learn about the tools that are available to support quality instruction. At the end of the day, it's about quality instruction, the technology, the AI, any of that stuff is only going to be there to support it. Yeah, and that's interesting because I, I had a, I, I presented AI at another meeting that I had, another teleconference that I had, a webinar, uh, and that was a big thing that a lot of the teachers says, this computers can't teach. I was like, no, they're not going to take away teaching. What they are able to do is tailor the, the uh, curriculum or the lesson plan uh, for that particular student. Um, the actual conveying of the information still has to come from a human, whether that human's on video or whether that human's in the classroom face-to-face uh, -face, 
or if they're remote, um, that conveying of the knowledge still has to come from the human. But wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to go worry about lesson plans anymore? And oh, by the way, you knew that your students were getting exactly what they needed to be successful and they didn't get promoted or pushed ahead until they performed up to the level that the AI says, yes, you've mastered this next module here. Uh, would that be a benefit? And, and, and I'll add to that. And I know Trina wants to get, uh, Dr. Coleman wants to get in. Um, <laughs> well, let me add to that. In the very beginning of this call, I said, we've been collecting data on students from the time they were in kindergarten, all the way through those students who finish at higher ed, right? There's enough information and enough data already to build certain AI models that we can fully take advantage of. We know, and we already know that if a kid can't read um, by the time they're in the third grade, they have a one in nine chance of ever graduating from high school. That's data that's already available to us, right? So the model to build is just a matter of, of, of bringing some quality um, critical thinkers and strategic thinkers and really design thinkers together, right, to build that model, to start on that model so that we can then take advantage of what you just described, uh, a lesson plan. These are the best lesson plans for these kids who fall into this, um, in, into this part of the model. We, we, mm -hmm. we know that. And, and, mm -hmm. and I don't mean to sound preachy, but I, I believe that we have access to all that data and we should be and should have been using that data to build out um, these instructional platforms, whether it's an AI model or or lesson plan spinner. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you put English in and boom, it gives you a lesson plan based on this kids, whatever their deficits and gaps are, because we've got enough data to figure that out. Trina, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, I do. I want to jump right in here. Uh, yes. One of the things that I see is uh, a huge problem is the, the writing. I don't know what AI can do to help that, but um, writing skills are horrific. And I, I attribute that, unfortunately, to the, the texting. <laughs> Students write papers with lowercase size. <laughs> they we really call them. We have Grammarly. We have, uh, we have, we have spell check. <laughs> Insufficient? <laughs> that, that's, not, that, that's not a substitute for knowledge, though. That's it where not, I am with this. Not, is, technology should not be, and I call it at SAAS scholarship as a service. It should not be that. <laughs> you should you should be able to comprehend things on your own. Let's say there's no internet, no technology. You are out in the middle of um, the desert somewhere, and yeah. but class is going on. What are you What are you gonna do? So really. Well, you so, lost. <laughs> so, so, what, so what Dr. Coleman is saying, um, other Dr. Coleman, is literacy is important. Yes. Literacy is at the very foundation of everything that we do or everything that we do in education. So mm -hmm. I don't mind getting texts from kids that are in lowercase, but they should know the right way to write. They should, they should understand that you is not you, is Y-O-U. I mean, they, <laughs> they should know that. <laughs> yes. So let me let me let me bring uh, Brian Brian into this discussion. Uh, so Brian, to kind of kind of bring you up to speed. Uh, the question is that Google technology has uh, Google uh, has this new technology that's AI based, um, and it can customize. It's it's, it's a student specific performance based, and it, it helps students base uh, bases a curriculum and a lesson plan unique to each and every student um, that's in the system, based off of many of the things we talked about, the data, the learning patterns, and all of that stuff. Um, and they've gone out and they've proved it. This is, this is a fictitional case, by the way. This is a fictitional scenario. Uh, they've gone out and proved that uh, it's, it's made a 60% improvement in students' uh, uh, performance on standardized tests in some of the poor school districts. And so I asked uh, Dr. Coleman, how would, that, how would the higher education use that for um, distant learning? And I asked uh, uh, Mr. Smith about how that would re resonate with his teachers. So I'll give you an opportunity to, to chime in because you work, work in both worlds, the higher education and the, uh, the K through 12 as well. So on my board at Setzer Group is a gentleman, Richard Boyd, who's the CEO at Tanjo. Now, Richard has a long history with the military, healthcare, workforce at emergent technologies, right? And currently, 
they are working on a lot of AI and machine learning and trying to you know, figure out how we can make sure that uh, if you have a bot that reviews heavy pieces of data like contracts or financial reports, that that bot can automate uh, understanding and sentiment analysis of that text, meaning that what used to take a thousand paralegals hours and hours, you can reduce that time to make really good decisions with complex patterns of words, right? So you have a very human issue there of when we began our conversations of could it replace adults or humans, certainly there are functions that adults do that it could certainly do better. That's automation in general. We've seen that from, you know, nobody's out there going, I really miss the smell of my horse's saddle. I wanna, I wanna get rid of cars, you know? So we've seen automation over time. What, what is interesting about where we are right now is not pitting ourselves against it, but the discussion is how do we partner with machines? How do we automate the task and the opportunities that can be done very quickly? Take K-12. There are rubrics and writing assessment that we can really help. You mentioned one of the tools Grammarly to help inform some of our choices. But as Trina points out, that's very different than the strategy, the contemplate, contemplative nature of scholarship and making choices and decisions for your writing. So the machine learning is not there yet. The AI is not quite there, but hold on because as it learns more, we're already seeing companies that can listen to conversations of help desk professionals or staff members and basically say, Trina's actually better with people than Brian or Rod and here's how we know. Her word choices have more economy in them. Her tone is being analyzed for sentiment. So it has the power to also coach and correct. Our challenge for the future is gonna be how we deploy it to create more time for humans to, to do what they do best. I think that's an excellent point. Um, I, I, I fully agree. Um, and I, I also want to, uh, I also try to assure that uh, many of the teachers that it will not replace human to human interaction. It, it will not. Um, and then there are things that it, I don't, in my opinion, as an engineer, I don't think we will ever get there, probably not in our lifetime or our kids' lifetime, maybe sometime further in the future, but I just don't see that happening um, in, in the next 50 to 60 years. Um, so let's take one question, one more question, and then, we'll, then we will wrap it up because it will be 7.30. Okay, Dr. Coleman, uh, let's see. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let's, we've got a host again of questions, so let's see if I can pick out one really quickly. This next question is coming from Michelle Joseph. She says, how do we address social emotional components to education? How can we include design thinking methodology in the schools to develop critical thinkers, empathetic leaders and creative problem solvers with the soft skills in demand for companies such as Google? So I will see Rod or Brian, which one do you want to take that first? And then I'll come back to Trina. Yeah, Brian, you go ahead. I'll think about my response. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I look at it as, you know, we are in the holistic era now. You, you can't go through COVID and not understand that we have deep societal inequities. And if people don't understand that some people had to leave our schools to go home to places of trauma, to places of uh, Maslow 101, where if you're not safe, you're certainly not learning. So because so many people experienced that and had to, for the first time at scale, in my opinion, really address equity, I mean, really address it, right? The, the silver lining out of that is we learned a ton. Now, will we go back to normal? Will we continue to serve white affluence and sort of, you know, 
uh, make the average the level of service? I, I don't think so. I, I think what we've exposed here is that the total child setting metrics for social emotional learning, thinking about how we're providing those services. I'm very hopeful that we've got two pandemics going on in this country, one uh, real and viral and another that we're about to unleash. And that's, we've got to really take care of humanity. And that starts with social and racial justice. And you can't do that without really understanding SEL and how we're going to solve for it. So whether you're talking about restorative justice, whether you're talking about emotional intelligence, whether you're talking about looking at discipline rates in K-12 or providing food security in higher ed, you no longer can get away with anything but a comprehensive design. Agreed. So, so uh, Mr. Smith, so Rod, you were talking to me about uh, how you guys are using human-centric design and design thinking um, in your program. Can you share a little bit more about that? Well, this was really before the pandemic, and we were just trying to figure out ways, how could we do a better job of ensuring our teachers uh, we're taking full advantage of the investments that we were making with classroom technology. <clears throat> so we, we were doing us, uh, we were building that design or designing that with a group of teachers because we had spent close to $40 million to outfit all our classroom with all this technology. Unfortunately, Dr. Coleman, that went away on hmm. uh, March 13th, I think, when we went into this pandemic. So I really would like to say that we circle back to some of the things that Brian talked about. We put in a fully comprehensive social emotional pro program for students. And, and when you think about design thinking in, in those terms, we had to go back and figure out how do we feed 54,000 students who are used to coming to school and getting at least two meals out of their day from the school system, right? So you're talking about a table of people that sat around and started to to, to design a solution to provide our community and students with food. So we took advantage of our nutrition department and our transportation department. We paired them together, just like many other school districts, transportation department, those drivers were gonna be working anyway. So they, they were delivering food. Um, I'll tell you another big thing that we did and talking about the social emotional um, deficit that we're having right now, kids are in trouble. I mean, kids are struggling, families are struggling. Um, Brian alluded to the pandemic, both of them that we're having right now. What I can tell you is right now, we use a system that we use Google. We're a big Google district, G Suite, right? So all, all of our students have access to Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Chat, uh, Google Meet, Google everything, right? And the students use that platform, but we use an additional platform to really scan what students are saying and doing, not from a security standpoint, but we're doing that right now from a social emotional standpoint so that we can find out what students are thinking. And let me just say this, and this is how serious it is. We have intervened with no less than 10 potential self-harm and suicide attempts with just this one tool. And, 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 and that's so serious when we're talking about designing for people. Uh, we, 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 we have to be in that mode where we're always designing for people and students are a part of that group of people. So I know I rambled a little bit, but, but I was expecting no, a different so question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is gonna be our final uh, question. I'm gonna let uh, uh, Dr. Coleman uh, wrap it up for us. Okay. And, uh, and then, then we will actually close out the meeting. <laughs> All right. Then, then the jacket will come off. <laughs> Last word, soft skills. I don't have any. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> as, <laughs> the thing about uh, social, emotional, soft skills and all of that stuff from a scientific perspective, we don't learn that stuff. We go into the calculus and all of that. But as an educator and being in this pandemic, I have learned a great deal about the real life experiences of students in higher ed. Uh, they have challenges. Uh, they are stressed. The day after the election, I had classes with my students at Bowie. And I said, how y'all doing today? I always say good afternoon. First thing I got was anxious. We talked both classes, morning and afternoon, spent the entire period. We did not talk about physics. We talked about the election. We talked about Black lives. 
We talk about social injustice, social, uh, cultural relevance, all of those types of things. So it's imperative that we remind ourselves that our students are human yeah. and that education is a multifaceted thing. And as Brian stated, there are inequities in uh, vast inequities within this country. Uh, we are seeing some of that stuff play out now, but our students are, are, are my measuring stick as far as how good, how bad. And, um, and um, so looking at how we can be better on a social level, how we can be innovative uh, is, is going to be something that will be iterative. Yeah, I'll share with you something that, yeah. that, that, that I, I came across as well. And that is that uh, when the, the uh, Silicon Valley tech companies um, went to the schools and said, you know, the, the kids that are coming to our companies don't have the right skills. And when they asked, what are the right skills? They said, first of all, they don't need to memorize a lot of stuff. They said, because with Google and all of these tools, we don't need them to memorize facts and figures and, and all that stuff. We need critical thinking. They need to have interpersonal skills and be able to work on the team. They need to know how to interpret and analyze data. It says really more about data and data analytics that's really important in interpreting that data. Um, and they need to be creative and innovative. And they said, those are the things that we really need. And our first century, first industrial revolutionary school system built in the 1800s is just not designed to do that. Uh, so I'm going to close with that, and I want to thank all of you, because I know we could talk all night, but I know people have other things to do, and I do appreciate everybody who's online. Keep in mind that you will get an email uh, with information on how to stay in touch with us. Um, we are going to uh, use this information in the chat, and we will send out an email where you can see what's in here, what some of the ideas and comments about. And this, uh, this uh, webinar is also recorded, and we will also make that available for those people who did not get a chance to, uh, to make it live. Again, I want to thank my guests, um, Dr. Trina Coleman, um, Mr. Brian Setzer, um, and Mr. Uh, Rod Smith uh, for their contribution to this. And thank you for your great following, uh, which is why we have such a great attendance here tonight. And I really do appreciate you guys for everything that you've done. Again, for the real time, thank you and have a good night. All right, I hope this is real this time. Thank you. <laughs> my pleasure. My pleasure. Enjoy it. I enjoyed Thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you.